Hi, if you think the Arduino or one of its uh, many compatible uh, units started the uh, embedded computer craze with uh, stackable boards and an industry standard form factor, or if you think, you know, Raspberry Pi is the duck's guts with its, uh, for if it, with its industry standard interface now, well, you'd be wrong. Maybe 25 years wrong, because here is the industry standard embedded computing platform. It's called PC104. And unless you're familiar with the industrial embedded PC scene, you may not ever heard of PC104. But this standard is an industry standard, has been for all, uh, 25 years now. In fact, it extends back to the late 80s um, as an industry standard footprint and there are countless manufacturers who manufacture stackable boards like this and you can actually get uh, boards and just stack them on top like that as many as you want limited by uh, the power supply or whatever system requirements you've got and if you think they've sold a lot of uh, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, I think you'll find that the PC-104 might have completely dwarfed the sales of those over the years because this is the industrial PC standard. Let's take a look at it. Now the story technically starts back in 1987 with a company called Ampro and they released what was called the Ampro Little Board slash PC and this was an early version of what was to become the PC 104 standard. But before that, back in the early 80s, Ampro actually released a CPM compatible uh, board which was basically a CPM single board computer. So if you think your Raspberry Pis and your Arduinos are pioneered this concept, you're well out of date. This thing's been going on since almost year dot of the uh, computer revolution. And then in 1989 they uh, released another version uh, which is more like the form factor that we're starting to see here. And then a couple of other companies started to uh, copy the Ampro one. And then in the early 90s, about 92, um, a lot of companies got together and said, hey, we need to form a consortium, develop a standard for this thing, which uh, was released as the PC-104 standard. And then it, it just exploded once that uh, standard was, it wasn't radical by the IEEE or anything else, but it was there was a PC-104 consortium of all these large industrial embedded uh, PC companies, and they all started to develop based on this same form factor of these uh, 0.1 inch uh, header connectors here uh, with the stackable modules. So the PC-104 standard basically uh, defines the size of the board, which is uh, not quite square. It's actually 96 by 90. Why that's the case, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and it defines basically the, uh, not only the size, but the mounting holes in here like this, and also the uh, PC-104 connector on the side. And this was actually uh, 64 pins total, and it basically duplicated the functionality of of the original IBM um, PC bus architecture. They added a few pins for, you know, some extra uh, grounds or whatnot, but it's basically electrically identical to the IBM PC bus. This uh, second one on here like this, which was an extra 40 pins, and uh, that was equivalent to the PC AT bus, 64 plus 40, 104 pins. And that's where the name come from, PC 104 standard. So they released that in 1992, so it's been 25 years since they released that standard and a whole host of companies started manufacturing this, these PC-104 compatible boards. But hey, they didn't stop there. Once uh, PCI became a thing, they re released the PCI-104 uh, form factor board with the additional PCI, and then they added PCI Express. And uh, they've, you know, reasonably kept pace reasonably with the interface standards, but they've always kept the legacy ISA uh, bus connectors on there with all the pins that allow you to stack the boards. But apart from that, everything else on the board was up for grabs. All these connectors could all be different. Uh, and the processors could be different, memory, whatnot. And, uh, you know, there were certain height uh, requirements, you know, physical requirements and things like that. But apart from that, it was only the mounting holes, the size, and the bus that was the uh, standard. And they were powered from uh, 5 volts through these uh, screw terminals here. Now, you may have guessed by now that this is actually an IBM PC. 
Um, it's a regular PC in an industrial uh, stackable form factor. This particular board here is the iCOP uh, 6050, a company called iCOP who are still going, still manufacturing these boards. This one dates from the early uh, 2000s. You can see the date code there, 2002, and it's got a DMMP uh, chipset, which is the uh, ALI M6117, and this is an 80386SX combined chipset, so it's got an Intel 80386SX uh, compatible processor in there, like a low power version, it's got all the peripherals, everything else built in to the one chip solution on there. It's got the AMI BIOS over here. It's got some external memory. It's got an, another ALI uh, chipset over here, presumably for IO, is it? Almost all single-sided. Got one tiny little thing over there, which is probably some uh, TTL job they couldn't fit on the top. Geez, the PCB designer must have been miffed about that. Um, gee, you didn't leave me enough room. Anyway, um, and then we've got the classic M systems disk on chip and this was an absolute game changer this is your uh, old school equivalent to your solid state drives you've got these days that you take for granted and they're nothing well this is what started it all that the m systems disk on chip and the disk on chip uh, 2000 it's basically a uh, flash drive in one single dip chip that's all <laughs> pretty much all there was to it and uh these range from uh i think 16 megabytes um up to one gig eventually before they were bought out by uh sandisk so this bad boy is basically an intel 80386sx uh, computer with solid state drive on it powered from a single 5 volt input with a 16-bit uh, ISA bus we've got a uh, floppy drive we've got IDE interface and uh, serial ports and whatnot on the thing and keyboard and mouse and everything else this did come in a V version which included the video but I didn't have that version I've only got the non video so you can get all sorts of boards for this thing, and so we'll take a look at this. This is the uh, uses the chips and technology 65545 uh, chipset. This was just a plug-on video card that could either power a uh, CRT output or an LCD over here. But the good thing about the PC104 standard is you could get boards for anything you wanted. If you wanted 8 or 16 serial ports um, for controlling all sorts of stuff back in the day, no problem. Just get your add-on boards. You wanted relay interfaces, isolated opto digital interfaces, whatever it was, you, ADCs, the whole works, uh, you know, data acquisition systems, you could get them for the PC104 format. And entire companies sprung up around just making these PC104 format boards, and a lot of them are still around today. This one, uh, in particular, ICOP, still making them. And these things were the duck's guts and basically still are for embedded computers. There are other platforms around, but the PC-104 uh, standard is still going. The consortium's still there. They're still promoting it. Companies are still manufacturing all these things. And in real industrial situations, like if you suggested using a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or anything else, they'd just laugh at you and go, no, rubbish. Give me PC-104. Thank you very much. And of course, there's been plenty of other uh, embedded PC uh, platforms that have tried to become sort of, you know, de facto industry standards and things like that. Some of them have. There's little modular based ones in dim sockets and all sorts of weird and wonderful ones. But nothing has uh, proven the test of time like the PC 104. I mean, they, after 25 years, still going strong. But of course, modern ones have kept up with the times. They've got Intel Atom processors or whatnot and Ethernet and wireless and all sorts of fancy pantsy stuff will be built onto them. So anyway, we've got this old school 80386SX with disk on chip. So I thought it'd be interesting to see if we can get this actually booted up um, and still working after, what, 15, 17 years or something like that. Eh, of course it will. These things lasted forever. They're still going. Now, of course, we have the uh, manual for this one, no worries, but uh, was not able to find the manual for the video card. So we're just going to have to suck it and see with this one. And uh, so what we're going to do is power up the processor board on its own first. Uh, five volts input, five volts and just one amp current limit. Um, it should be enough. It wouldn't take more than five watts, surely. Uh, from memory, these are only like a couple of watts. Fingers crossed. Hello. 
Hello. 1.8 watts. I expect that to maybe change. Yeah, 1.9. Yep. 2.3. Okay. So half an amp, maybe. It should be in the bias now if it's uh, still working. And you'll notice that there's none of this, you know, power or status lead rubbish on this thing. No, that's just a waste of space. So um, yeah, no indication at all that that thing's uh, going apart from the current consumption. So the power consumption, uh, 2.3 watts, yeah, it's a bit higher on idle than, say, a modern uh, Raspberry Pi or something like that. But for back in the day, that was pretty impressive. All right, so we'll switch that off now and we'll stack our video card on. I'll keep the uh, current limit on there. This should take another, you know, half a watt or something like that, perhaps. Got a jumper on here which says uh, 5 volts uh, slash 3.3 volts, but there's no header on there at all. There's a header on this one over here. E1, E3, I presume that's some sort of address, um, but I think, I don't think that's for the regulator, I think that might be for uh, maybe something external over here perhaps. It should just power up, that's what I'm going to do, I'm not going to bother putting a jumper on, let's see what happens. It's going over there, there's some plane going over there, I think I could be right on that. Now, of course, we can choose to either stack this on the top or stack it on the bottom. The problem with the bottom is we know this is, you know, this should be working. We've got the full manual, everything for it. Um, so I'm going to stack it on top just so we have access to uh, probe things and stuff like that while we're mucking around trying to get uh, at least a signal out of this video card and get it hooked up to a monitor. Now, if you've never plugged these on before, you don't know the force of a hundred pins uh, like that. It is very substantial. Don't put it down like that and just press because you can accidentally bend uh, the long fragile pins on the bottom. So you've got to stand it upright like that and gently uh, get it in there like that and it stands off like that. We can put the extra standoffs in there later but you know there's fairly good rigidity in that already. You didn't really have to put the jumpers in. Certainly not just for bench evaluation and stuff like that. All right, here we go. I've kept my one amp current limit. Hey, it hasn't got five. It's more, 2.7 watts. Once again, this should increase. So it's drawing more current than before. So my hunch on that uh, regulator was right. It didn't need that jumper. 3.7 uh, odd watts with the chips and technology video card. Awesome. I mean, that was absolutely incredible power consumption uh, for the day because, like, your typical PC was drawing, you know, uh, tens and tens of watts. Um, even your laptops and uh, stuff like that were. So to get an embedded uh, platform working on just a couple of watts was really amazing stuff. Now we have to try and get some video out of this and we've got our three connectors on here. It's not these, these are for your uh, flat panel uh, display because the chips and technology uh, 65, 545 for those playing along at home could do both um, RGB CRT output and flat panel display. So ta-da, this one over here must be your CRT RGB and a dead giveaway you've got three resistors like that, there they are for your R, G and B uh, uh, output impedances. And if we have a look, 14, coincidentally the standard uh, VGA video connector is 15, so they've gone for 14 and pin 15 on a regular VGA connector is not used. Basically we only use pins uh, 1, 2 and 3 for your RGB signals and four, uh, sorry, 13 and 14 for your uh, horizontal and vertical sync. So my educated guess would be if this designer was uh, competent in the least, they would have made the pinout match the pinout for the VGA. You know, one, two, three, and then four, yeah, the two on the end. They should be it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to probe the uh, just the resistors on top first because they're easy and see what we get. Hello. Hello. There we go. Single. There's our video information. And yeah, so that's our RGB. Well, that's one of them. It's red, green or blue. And bingo, there's the other resistor. And there's the other one. So if I'm right. Hello. Yep. And because it's going to be a staggered pin configuration, there you go, and pin three, bingo. So by that logic, 
<laughs> no pun intended, the two end pins here, 13 and 14, should be the H-Sync and V-Sync. Oh, hello. Because they'll be uh, TTL level signals, one volt per division. So the RGB was lower, of course. Bingo. That will be our horizontal because of the frequency of it and the continuous nature and the vertical should be a pulse like that. We got it. We're in like Flynn. So we at least have a video signal coming out of this. I'll just solder some wires on the back going off to a uh, D15 and I reckon we're going to get the bias to boot on this puppy because the power consumption you saw, it went through the different stages. Have a look and you see that it, it starts up as jumping all over the place, which indicates the process is going through different various modes and then it will eventually settle on power figure, which should be the bias uh, screen. I decided to just chop up an existing VGA lead. I've got a bunch of these. If you haven't seen inside these, these are actually uh, very well shielded and you can get like crap quality ones back in the day and for high resolution uh, displays, you really needed a high quality uh, cable for it anyway. So they've got the outer uh, braid, then encasing the whole thing, they've got the uh, foil and inside these are once again, individually shielded, because they're serious, that's to stop uh, crosstalk between the two. Internally, that's your red signal, that's your green signal, and that's your blue, conveniently color-coded, your RGB, uh, because they, they're analog signals. The VGA is an analog uh, display. And this white one here, that would be your uh, horizontal sync, because that's a uh, high frequency. And the rest of that, uh, you could just uh, buzz those out to figure out what one's what. No worries. All right, fingers crossed. Let's give that a bell, see if we get lucky. All right, are we feeling lucky, punk? You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Switch it on. Uh, yes, we're in like Flynn. A little bit how you doing, because, uh, you know, our, we've mucked up the signal integrity just a tad. But it boots no worries whatsoever. Main processor ALI M6117, screaming 40 megahertz, 640K. No one will ever need more than 640K. <laughs> EMS, you remember when you had to use EMS? That was, ah, uh, those were the days. Okay, so we can fix that uh, display. It should be the braid. So what I'm going to do is just, um, <laughs> I forgot to connect up the braid. So I'm going to hook the braid just up to ground here. And uh, we should see a very significant improvement. Ta-da! <laughs> That's the difference between the shield and no shield on the signal integrity. It's just the clock recovery inside there. It's all jittery as buggery. Full boot sequence for those playing along at home. Ta-da! Copyright 1996. Wow. 32 meg. Wait, wait, wait. We're in. Now, it came with the uh, keyboard cable on it. Unfortunately, it's the old five pin DIN PS2 standard. And the only keyboard I had that had a five pin DIN is my old Tandy 1000 keyboard. I've actually done a video on the Tandy 1000 PC and how I uh, designed a turbo board uh, for that back in the day. So th that's a really old video. I don't think it's got a huge number of views. I'll link that one in at the end. So what I've done is hacked in a PS2 keyboard. I didn't have a PS2 keyboard, but luckily I found one down in the dumpster. Uh, no worries at all. And had a real hard time finding a PS2 connector for that. Hmm. Anyway, I bodged that one in. Let's power it up. And we're in like Flynn. Ha <laughs> ha, it worked. Beautiful. So we've got standard CMOS set up. The uh, date's a little bit out because we don't have a battery in there. Boot sector virus protection. Love it. Ah. And our boot up sequence is okay. It's going from uh, C, but we've got nothing in our disk on chip. We just take for granted our, you know, USB ports and everything else these days, but I can hook, find and hook up an old three and a half inch floppy. And in the advanced chipset setup, this GPCS function, this is actually uh, how we set up the um, M Systems disk on chip. And these are the, according to the manual, these are the settings that you need. So it's all set up hunky dory, but of course there's nothing on it. 
Well, found myself a three and a half inch uh, floppy drive, but uh, I had to scrounge together an old machine to actually uh, get a floppy drive connector in it. You might recognize this one. This is a uh, dumpster, the XPS uh, 420. Used to use this as the uh, live, the lab uh, live machine uh, and make a DOS bootable disk. I do have a DOS bootable disk somewhere, but um, I, I don't know, it might just be easier to do this than try to dig that out of the archives. Damn it, setting up old computers is a pain in the ass, it really is. Look at the right speed on this puppy, like a bat out of hell. Really have to get myself one of those newfangled USB three and a half inch floppies on eBay. It's just, this is ridiculous. All right, let's try it. I've got it hooked up. I've got the uh, drive powered from an external PC because I don't want to uh, dick around trying to do that. So let's switch her on. It's reading. Drive light's coming on. It's reading. XDOS. XDOS. Oh. Ah. Fatal error reading disk. Load in. Aborted. Wah, 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 wah. That's a disk that came with it. So it actually came with the XDOS operating system. Wow. Hands up if you use that. Designed and written by uh, Thierry Giron. Good on you, Thierry. Okay, this has got the MS-DOS boot disk. Disk I.O. error. Ah. Well, I'm having no luck, but... I found this in the attic, uh, clean boot disk DOS 6.22 with scan and TBAV. So obviously this was my boot disk from way back if I had any virus troubles. This one was like a guaranteed, you know, right protected uh, version of DOS 6.22 with uh, antivirus, I think Thunderbolt. Let's give it a bell. It's been up in the attic though, which is not temperature controlled, so it's temperature cycled. So I don't like the chances of that, it's been up there for a long, long time, especially with the Australian heat and everything. Um, I still can't find my box of uh, floppies, by the way. My original, I had two boxes of floppies, cannot find them. It's loading. Whoa! Starting MS-DOS! No, no disk errors yet, this is promising. We're in! We're in! New date, whatever. I don't care. New time. Are we in? We're in! The prompt! The A prompt! Yes! Finally! So we actually do have a C drive that's working, but obviously there's nothing in there. It's called disk on chip. So we need to copy the operating system, a bootable version of the operating system onto there. For fun, let's go into TBAV here. So who had Thunderbolt the virus detector back in the day? 89 to 95. Ah, those were the days. I just love the mix of old school uh, prompt here with the rest of the uh, screen overlaid in memory. Anyway, do we have sys? No, we don't have sys because that's normally how you uh, do that. All we've got is literally nothing else on there. It was just command.com because sys was the command that you used to transfer the operating system to another disk. And that's what we want to do. We want to copy DOS 6.22 onto the C drive. Maybe we can actually install this uh, XDOS thing. It, this is the original disk that actually came with it. So I'm going to do, it's just got command.com. It's got those DOS files, of course. I'm going to do install and see what that does. So, because otherwise I've got to take the floppy drive to another machine, hook it up, transfer from USB, download the sys files from somewhere like the internet, and then uh, it's just messy. Please boot first with the XDOS 5 to run install. And we know it doesn't boot. Oh! Finally, I'm at the point where I've got a bootable MS-DOS disk. I've got all the uh, files on there I need, including the all-important sys uh, slash question mark. There we go. So drive and uh, then a copy from drive A to drive C. So that should work. So let's go sys uh, drive one specifies the location of the system files, A, and then C. Sys A C. How's that? I think it likes that. Come on, let's boot this disk on chip. System transferred! Woo! Yeah, command.com. Now let's reboot this puppy and see what happens. So I'm going to take the disk out. I can give it the three finger salute. 
Uh, it should know there's no drive in A, and it should try and boot from C. So, fingers crossed. Come on. Starting MS DOS! We're in! We're in! Ta da! C prompt, and that was with no floppy! We did it! <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner! I finally got a bootable DOS 6.22. PC 104 board. You have no idea of the amount of effort I went to. It's taken me probably like a full day's work to get this thing booted. Like, and many trips to the bunker and back home and up in the attic and all sorts of places to get this damn thing working. But it boots and the disk on chip from N Systems still works a treat. Awesome. Ah, uh, I can remember when DOS 6.22 came out and we got things like, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm not sure whether it was 6.25 from to 6 or something and we got edit and we got things like scan disk. You know, we got some decent uh, upgrades in, uh, I think from DOS, at least from DOS for 4 to 6. I started out with DOS 3.1 or something, or something like that, I can't recall. Hmm, anyway. Copied a couple of games on there too, tiny little DOS games. Uh, I think with all this stress, I'm going to have to uh, play Eliza. Hi, I'm Eliza. I'm your personal therapy computer. Yeah, I need it. Please tell me your problem. Old computers are hard. Do computers worry you? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Why did you repeat yourself? I don't know. Don't you really know? No. Are you saying no just to be negative? Yes. <laughs> I see. This is not getting very far. Now I'm running an old version of Donkey. Um, apparently this one is famous because it was actually co-written by Bill Gates himself to demonstrate the graphics capabilities of the early PC. Hey, what do I have to do? Oh, I've got to avoid donkeys. Hang on. Yep. Oh. Wow, this is stunning. Ah, oh, doesn't get any better. <laughs> Good on your Bill. I tell you what, a game I really liked when I was a kid I played this forever. Pango? Do you use a colour monitor? You bet your ass. Level 1. Novice. You yeah, haven't played it in 30 years. Pango. Oh, I used to... Whoa, that's super quick. That's... Uh, yeah, that was the problem with games back in the day. If That's why we had turbo buttons so you could slow down the computer um, for these old DOS games. <laughs> so, uh, it's not moving. Ah. Oh. Anyway, oh, I've, it always looked better than that. Maybe they had like a higher res version or something. Hmm. Welcome to Breakout. Whatever happened to Ken Silverman, I wonder. Good on you, Ken. Ah, oh, look at this. Oh, God, not quick enough. It can't, can't, it can't respond quick enough. The, key, the, key, the keys cannot respond quick enough to play this game. No. No kidding, I suck. So I hope you enjoyed that look at the PC-104, which is still a standard these days, especially uh, in military and lots of other industrial applications. They still swear by the PC-104 standard. And it started in the late 80s, still going, what, uh, close to 30 years later for a standard. That's pretty awesome. Will the Arduino be around in 30 years, Raspberry Pi? Anyone? Hmm, I don't know, but PC-104, you don't hear about it, but it's still going strong. So, I hope you enjoyed that and my struggle to get disk on chip working. I, trust me, you didn't see the half of it. Wow, it's just so difficult getting these old machines up and running. Unless you've got everything there and you work on old computers all the time. i got stuff scattered from here to Timbuktu and, well, that was not easy at all. A bit of luck didn't go my way. Things screwed up, but I eventually got the thing working. So, anyway... If you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up. And as always, discuss down below and subscribe over here and subscribe to EV Blog 2 up here. I'm releasing lots of videos on EV Blog 2. So if you're not subscribed, um, it'll be at the end. It's not right now, but it'll be right at the end. Um, subscribe to EV Blog 2 because there's heaps happening over there. Anyway, 
Catch you next time.